Hi everyone. Um, so today's going to be really short. We're going to be talking about chapter 10 and this is financial risk um, and required return. So again, you know, very short lecture, um, but we're going to be talking about some of the most important concepts um, in financial analysis, which are financial risk and financial return. Um, talking about what is financial risk exactly, how do we measure it, and why is it so important uh, in our decision making. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started looking into it. Uh, again, as, as normal, uh, here are your competencies for this particular lecture overall. Um, but when we talk about financial risk, uh, we need to talk about, you know, when, when is financial risk present? And so financial risk is present, um, as you can imagine, whenever there's some kind of chance of earning less than we expect on any type of investment we make. Um, so really, you know, in other words, we can say that the probability of us getting a really good return or a return on investment or ROI is uh, far below what we anticipate. So we're going to, we see that there's going to be more risk associated there. So we have a couple different attitudes or positions that investors can take um, towards risk and how we kind of approach it and handle it. Um, the first, uh, investors can tend to be risk neutral. Um, you know, just like it sounds like they're, they can be indifferent. Um, it doesn't really matter to them the difference between the two alternatives. They're just overall neutral. Um, then they can be risk averse. Uh, so they avoid risk at all costs. Uh, just taking that sure bet, that sure thing, the, very, very, very low risk, knowing that they're going to get the return that they need and or want on their investment. But then we have some that are more risky. They like to take gambles. Um, so that we term these risk seekers. So you can imagine overall most investors, investors are going to be risk averse. You know, we don't want to, it's human nature. We don't necessarily want to take unnecessary risks. Um, so we're going to try to uh, avoid those at all costs. So most investors do tend to be risk averse. When we talk about, um, you know, think back to when you took pro, uh, problem stats, uh, you know, when we talk about the chance of something occurring, we, we call it its probability or its probability of occurrence, uh, where we list all the, the outcomes um, and the the possibilities that go along with those outcomes. So if we take, for example, a coin toss, we either know we're going to get heads or we're going to get tails. So we have a 50% chance that we're going to get heads, 50% chance that we're going to get tails. So I want to, um, moving into from probability and kind of understanding that concept, moving more into expected and realized rates of return, um, I want to go over this, um, this project proposal quickly and understand that you're going to keep referring back to this over the next couple slides because we're going to use the data on here to do a couple of calculations. Um, so what we have are uh, the, the economic state that we may see ranging from very poor all the way to very good with a rate of return for two different projects that we're going to look at, either investing in an MRI machine or investing in a new clinic. Um, so we look at the probability of occurrence of these different economic states and these different rates happening. Um, and we're going to use, like I said, this data going forward uh, as we do a couple of calculations. So you may want to um, screenshot this slide, print it off, keep it right there with you as you're taking your notes so that you don't have to keep flipping back and forth um, as we keep referring back to it. So when we talk about probability, um, the next kind of logical um, step that we're going to take is expected rate of return. We call this the ER, um, or the expected rate of return. And how we go about solving for expected rate of return is we first look at the probability of the event happening um, multiplied by the return that we expect. And then we add that to the probability, uh, the second probability of the event happening multiply by the second um, rate of return and so on and so on. Um, and I know that's a little fuzzy, uh, so we'll go through an example going back to this slide um, and looking at the expected rate of return in regards to the MRI machine. So make sure you have your data table there. Um, and we'll walk through an example and hopefully this will help tie it together for you. So if we're looking at the expected rate of return on the MRI machine, we set our formula up the same way. So we have 
the expected rate of return on the MRI machine is going to equal, now when we look, we're going to take the probability of occurrence um, at the very poor economic state. So we know that the probability of that happening is 0.1. And then we're going to multiply that by the rate of uh, the rate of the project that we're looking at, which is the MRI machine. So if you go back to your data table, we'd look at economic state very poor, probability of occurrence 0.1, and then the rate of the uh, rate of return on the MRI project is going to be a negative 10%. So we put plug in our negative 10% here, and then uh, to that we're going to add the probability of occurrence in the poor economic state, which is 0.2, see 0.2 here. We're going to multiply by that the rate of return in the poor state uh, of the MRI project, which is zero, and keep on adding. So we're going to go through the average um, economic state at 0.4. We're going to go through the good state at 0.2 and uh, end with the very good state at 0.1. Um, and again, multiplying each one of those by the correlating rate of return for that particular project. So after you set up your uh, <clears throat> after you set up your formula, you'll go ahead and calculate it out. And what you should get is 10%. So you're taking the sum of this equation here and adding to that the sum of this uh, the next uh, probability plus probability three plus probability four and then plus probability five. And you should end with an expected rate of return on the MRI machine overall at 10%. Um, so if we look at the expected rate of return on the clinic, um, I want you guys to go ahead, if you can, pause the video here and try to calculate out what that expected rate of return is for the clinic before you move forward, uh, because we'll go through the answer, but I want you to try and go through this um, independently to, to, to make sure that you're on track with how to calculate these expected rates of return. So as we move forward, if you did the calculation, um, what we should see here is taking the expected rate of return in the very poor economic state of 0 0.10, or yes, 0 0.10, and uh, multiplying that by the uh, rate of return for the clinic now. So Let's back up to our table. Now we're looking at the clinic before we're looking at the MRI. Um, now we're moving over to the clinic. So we're going to take whoop, we're going to take uh, our 0.1 in the very poor probability of occurrence economic state. We're going to multiply that by our rate of return on the clinic at negative 20, and set it up just like we did for the MRI machine. So we'll have 0.2 times 0, 0.4 times 15, uh, 0.2 times 30, and 0.1 times 50 and you should arrive at an expected rate of return at 15%. Now, if you didn't, um, you know, shoot me an email and we'll work through it uh, because I want to make sure that you guys have these calculations on point. So when we're looking at expected rate of return versus realized rate of return, so what we were just calculating with the MRI in the clinic was the expected rate of return. This is what we expect to get back on our investment into that project. So the expected rate of return um, is estimated before an investment is made. Um, and you can go ahead and surmise that the, uh, the uh, after the fact, the return uh, and what is actually achieved is called the realized rate of return. So we have two different types of returns. We have the expected rate of return and the realized rate of return. Expected, of course, before um, the investment is made and then realized rate of return is what we actually realize as the rate of return. So remember, you know, expect we're just making a best guess estimate um, and after the fact the realized rate of return is what was actually returned. Um, and it's important to note here too that our realized rate of return and our expected rate of return, what we anticipate is going to happen, are rarely going to equal out on each other uh, because there's a lot of different things that can have happen economic-wise. There can be some different shifts in the economy that can cause um, our returns to not come back what we kind of estimated them to be. Um, a lot of different factors can go into it. So the two are rarely going to equal out to each other.
Now when we talk about standalone risk and how it works into expected and realized rate, rates of return. Um, so we talk about um, risk of having that individualized investment, which we say is held in isolation, so it's there by itself. Um, it's not part of a portfolio. It's not part of a grouping of other types of investment. It's one singular investment that's held by itself in isolation. Um, so, so when we talk about standalone risk, just understand that it is that singular investment that's held in isolation by itself, not grouped with another uh, investment as part of a portfolio standing together. Um, so how we measure standalone risk in terms of expected and realized and how it helps us facilitate decision making on which kind of project that we want to go through based on the return, we measure standalone risk in terms of the degree separation uh, from the return distribution or, the, or it's termed the tightness um, of the return distribution. So if we have a tight return in terms of standalone risk, um, we have a return on our investment that falls close to what we expected. Remember we said the expected um, and the realized are rarely going to equal each other out, but we can have a tight return where our distribution is going to fall very, very close to what we expected to return. And so this is going to indicate to us that we're going to have very uh, or relatively lower standalone risk as opposed to maybe some other investments that we might make. Now on the reverse of that, we have the loose return, um, which you, you can expect, you know, the distribution is going to be well below what we expected. Um, so this is going to indicate to us that that, that particular investment is very risky um, and we may want to do some further analysis before we decide to invest in this very, uh, this investment that has a very loose return on it. So if you're thinking back to probability and statistics, um, one measure and, and probably the most common measure used out in the field for standalone risk is the standard deviation and, and how we measure the distribution. So standard deviation shouldn't be anything new. Um, hopefully you've at least heard the term since you've been in school. Um, but standard deviation is how we're going to measure that return distribution. Um, and just kind of as a recap, we represent the standard deviation with the lowercase sigma here. So kind of little circle with the hat on top. Um, but what this tells us is the smaller standard deviations, the tighter distribution, and the lower standalone risk of investment is going to be the smaller standard deviation. So the smaller your standard deviation, that's going to indicate to you the tighter that the investment is or the tighter the distribution is. So it's going to think back to what we just said on the previous slide. That's going to indicate to us very relatively low standalone risk. So we like to see small standard deviations um, because that's going to indicate to us that there's not that much risk involved in this particular investment. Uh, so how we calculate the standard deviation, and, and you know, this may be a review for some of you. Um, we take the square root of the variance. So, so going back to how we set up to first find the variance, and then we can work on taking the square root of that. The variance is going to be our probability of our return one times, and in brackets here we have the rate of return one minus the expected rate of return one squared. Um, and then we set the same thing up uh, for the next one and so on and so on. So think back to when we were doing the expected rate of return, um, we set it up with the probability of the occurrence multiplied by the rate of return and we added that to the probability 2 of the occurrence times the rate of return 2 for the occurrence and so on and so on. So now we're just taking that a step further here and saying that we're going to take the probability of the return for the, the first indicator there and multiply that by the uh, sum of the rate of return 1 minus the expected rate of return 1. And then we're going to square that. And don't worry, we got a couple examples that we're going to go through. So, you know, you're not just kind of left in the dark on what to do. Um, 
but here is the formula kind of condensed down. Same thing as what we presented up here, just less wordy. Um, so we're going to have the variance equals the probability of return 1 multiplied by the uh, rate of return 1 minus the expected rate of return 1 squared. We're going to take that and add it to the probability of return 2 multiplied by the rate of return for 2 minus uh, the expected rate of return for 2 squared. And, you know, if you have multiple, um, if you have multiple rates of return that you're looking at, you just keep going. Um, so let's, let's work into our example. Um, refer back to your uh, table that we went over a couple slides ago regarding the MRI and the clinics. We're going to look at these two different por portfolios separately. Um, and let's go ahead and figure out the standard deviation and the variance. Um, for the MRI machine, um, and we'll go through and, um, and and go through and calculate that and see what the dis, uh, what the standard deviation tells us and how that compares to the clinic, and go through how we would make a decision on which pr um, project to kind of go after. So we have our formula, and I would recommend you know just memorizing put this formula to memory every time you see it. Um, uh, an equation or a problem that requires this formula, just go ahead and write it down at the top. Um, that way you have it there. If you can at least just remember this first part, you know, the next um, is pretty kind of self-explanatory. So we have our equation for variance. So we need to solve for variance first. Remember, because standard deviation is the square root of the variance, so we need to find the variance first. And you should always be given um, what your expected rate of return is. So let's say for our MRI machine that we're going to look at, our expected rate of return is 10%. So how would we go about setting up that calculation? So we're going to take our, um, looking back at our table, we're going to take our probability of occurrence for the very poor economic state at point 0.1, which we know. We're going to multiply that by our rate of return for the MRI machine which is 10% or negative 10%. We're going to subtract from that 10% because that is our expected rate of return on the machine. And we're going to square that. And we move on to the next one uh, where we take 0.2 in the poor economic state, multiply that by the rate of return at zero, subtract from that 10% and square it, and then multiply that by 0.2 and so on through the next uh, three portfolios that we have out there, or three um, return rates that we have out there. So when you get done with the calculation, what you should end up with is 120. So now we have the, very, uh, the variance uh, for the MRI machine, and now we need to go uh, figure out what the standard deviation is. So now that we have the variance, all we need to do is take the square root um, of the MRI machine, which is 120, and we should get 11%. Uh, now, I didn't go through the calculation for the clinic. Uh, you're welcome to work that out. You should arrive with a standard deviation of 18%. If you don't, again, email me. We'll work through it um, and see kind of what your calculations look like. But the question here is, um, what's the standard deviation of the variance of the MRI in the clinic? So we went through and solved that. We had a variance of 120, and when we took the standard deviation, that ended at 11% for the MRI machine, and then 18% for the clinic. So now we need to see, you know, just based off this information, which one do you think has more standalone risk? Now remember we said the smaller the standard deviation, the less, the less risk, the tighter uh, distribution that it has, so we can automatically start to assume that the clinic is going to have more standalone risk uh, simply because the standard deviation is higher than what we saw with the MRI uh, project. So as we continue the discussion on this particular topic, um, we look at the expected rate of return at 10%, uh, which was given when we started to solve the problem here, uh, expected rate of return at 10%. So if we have the MRI at 10, we have the expected rate of return for the clinic at 15, we have the standard deviation for the MRI at 11, standard deviation for the clinic at 18. Um, when we assume these two projects are more mutually exclusive, just meaning, you know, if one happens, the other can't. So if we choose to do the MRI, we can't do the clinic. 
we choose to do the clinic, we can't do the MRI, um, you know, based on the information, which one should we choose? And if we go along with the principles that we've already talked about and the information we've talked about so far, logic would tell us that we need to choose the MRI machine simply because it has the tighter distribution. See how close the standard deviation is to the expected rate of return at 10%. We're only one percentage you know, away from each other where the clinic is several apart. So we have a lower risk of, we have a lower risk with the MRI. We have the tighter standard, or the tighter distribution with a lower standard deviation. Um, so the, the project that should be chosen is the MRI machine simply for those couple factors that we talked about. Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and stop the video here um, and we'll pick up with the second part to just kind of break it up. So come back for part two of um, financial risk and required return.